Hey y'all, today is the second part of a three-part series where I explain capitalism. My goal is to explain the basics of what capitalism is, what it does, why, and how to stop it. In my last video I explained what capitalism is, and today I want to explain what it does and why. As with the last video, a lot of this is informed by my reading of Wage, Labor, and Capital, anarchist ideas of power structures, and my experience within these systems. If you already have a good grasp of capitalism from a leftist perspective, feel free to skip the first video. If you have only learned about capitalism through the education system, I highly recommend going to watch that one. The link is in the description. I cannot separate this video into discrete sections as easily as the last one. The main topic I will be talking about is something called capital accumulation, and I will then be going into the impacts of that. From there, I will talk about how capital accumulation causes the rigidity of capitalism and shapes the impacts of any attempted reform on the system. Capital accumulation is, in my opinion, the defining feature of how capital interacts with us. It is the action that derives most of its impacts on us as people on technology, and on what social systems we exist in. To start us off, capital accumulation is the process of capital making more capital. First, I will explain how this is done, then I will explain why, and with that, how it cannot be avoided within this system. As we talked about last time, capital has an important feature called profit. This profit, by and large, is used to purchase more capital, both through buying new commodities that are then turned into means of production, and through taking control of means of production that are not currently capital. Examples of this include a train network, using its profit to lay down more tracks and buy more trains. Another example is Walmart making more Walmart stores or industrial farming companies buying more land from the corn they have sold. Capital is like gray goo, attempting to turn everything it touches into more of itself. To show why this happens, I will start by explaining what happens to capital that doesn't participate in this. As we outlined last time, capital becomes more efficient, at least in terms of markets, as it accumulates. When this happens, more labor is required to use all the means of production. But for each unit of labor, more commodities are produced. Now imagine we have a society made out of many companies of the same size, with a single one deciding to accumulate capital. As this capitalist accumulates capital, it produces more commodity and at a lower cost. So with supply and demand, it must sell more of the commodity and is able to. At a lower price, every other capitalist finds itself making less profit because it must lower its prices to compete. Not only are they making less profit, they are specifically making less than the company that grew. Even if it does not make any more money from this directly, it decreases the profit of others. To put it simply, the capitalists that did not accumulate must sell things for a lower price and, without decreasing costs, lower margins. Now, if this first company kept accumulating, it could eventually lower the price to below the cost of production of these other businesses, making profit impossible for them, and eventually putting them out of business entirely. Like, there is no way me alone is going to outcompete Microsoft and make a new console bigger than the Xbox. Same thing with your local grocery store when Walmart shows up. So that means a business that is not accumulating capital will be weeded out. That isn't the end of the story, however. Capital accumulation is compounding. Even if these businesses once made the same amount of profit as their larger counterpart, they do not anymore. This means they cannot accumulate capital at the same rate as the larger one. And the difference will only increase over time as with every step their accumulation will be smaller than their competitors. They were doomed the second we started. Maybe some randomness of the system can save them. I could of course win the lottery tomorrow, 
and decide to buy them a whole lot of capital. It will simply be replacing who is in the position, not changing anything about it. Because the only thing you win in this game is the chance to play again tomorrow. And with that kind of game, trends are what went out. There is a reason lottery tickets are called attacks on the poor. You lose money on average. Attempting to step across the divide involves you widening it. And to be clear, the trend of capital accumulation holds within it the trend of sacrificing everything to make as much short-term profit as possible. Even if there is a brick wall ahead, we as a society will have to step on the gas. Now before y'all stop and jump to the comments, this includes why business running off and hiding in its own market is not a permanent solution, and why even stunning new innovations won't change this process. Now, let me talk about stepping on the gas. As these smaller companies are stomped out by the ones that accumulated capital, the system obviously gets more centralized. Walmart, as a company, has more revenue than most states. Now, because I would like to avoid catching the attention of the algorithm, I will say this in vague terms. But if a company was able to lower prices long enough for a related project to be no longer able to make profit and drop out, you could conceivably reverse the process afterward to increase profits in that area. This is one process leading to centralization under capitalism, through direct action of the capitalists in favor of that. Centralization is clearly not good, but scratching the surface is an understatement. They influence lots of different aspects of our society. What I would say is much more important is how capital accumulation impacts the different systems we exist in as a society. I will use the gender binary as an example of this. I am trans, so I have experience with the topic after all. Takes a while to get there though, so bear with me. We get to this topic by asking a single, very important question. Alright, capital accumulation is about maximizing profit. So what maximizes profit? I said in my last video that profit is the difference between what the workers produce and what they are paid. Another way to think about it is what the workers pay the capitalists in order to access the means of production. So we can phrase this as, what allows you to maximize a price? Dependence. Insulin is required for life. So if someone is diabetic and can't get it any other way, they will be forced to pay any price. Just look at the US. The form of dependence that benefits capitalists comes from the systematic denial of access to other methods of production and other ways to access what you need to survive. This denial cannot be done just by structures such as law. The enforcement benefits heavily from being built into people's social relations, ideology, etc. Some of these are simply more conducive to capitalism and its expansion. A religion with a major feature being large-scale collective meals will simply be harder to throw capitalism at. I wish I had more of that type of thing near me. If you have the opportunity to walk out of your job and not starve the next day, the capitalist has a lot less hold on you to keep your wages low. Not having something like this is a really big blow to the worker. This denial does not even need to be strict. It can also be subtle. In fact, subtle things are more likely to persist as less people will be actively fighting against them. A small, indirect barrier making things more difficult to do outside of wage labor can tip the scales. A major way capitalists do this is by forcing you to do a minimum amount of hours in order to get the most out of your labor, like getting access to health care through your job. Sure, you can garden, but the labor for food is already done. You can't choose what to do labor for piecemeal. This barrier doesn't even need to be intentional either. Let me give you an example. Let's take gardening. If it took me 8 hours worth of labor to produce an amount of food, it would require me 10 hours of wage labor to buy. The obvious choice would be to garden. I would save 2 hours of time, while at the same time knocking 10 hours of wage labor out. Making gardening take 11 hours of labor would flip the script. 
increasing the amount of labor that is wage labor by 10 hours through making other kinds of labor a little more difficult. The more wage labor we have to do, the lower wages are, because the more competition there is in such. A subtle social change leading to that change in efficiency of gardening can make a huge difference. Now, an easy solution is saying, this won't be a big deal. The markets will just come to balance it out where it is 10 hours of labor for each. Well, if that was the solution, I would have a garden outside my apartment window right now. As it turns out, I do not. This isn't because gardens are shit. People are starving and food prices are rising, after all. I gave a hint as to one reason why already. Apartments. The very existence of apartments as a form of organization gives the capitalists around them a boost by increasing dependence on capital. My point here, though, is that I can still garden. I can still go to a community garden, or I can plant things in pots here. But there is not a community garden within a mile of me. So that adds on to the labor involved. Yet there is a major patch of green space right outside my window. And pots cost money. And all things considered aren't very efficient. I literally have to pay for soil. I do it anyway because of ideology. But because of that minimum amount of wage labor that an apartment certainly doesn't help with, it is extra labor. A hobby. More work while we are being worked to death is not quite the long-term solution I am looking for. But we can talk about that in the next video. Enough skirting around the issue, though. To put it simply, paying for rent requires more work than not having the rent to pay. Spreading apartments to an area is definitely not subtle as well. People like their houses. Also, not a slow and social process. Either you live in an apartment or you do not. So people can clearly see how being forced into them makes you have to do more work within capital. And thus, helps out capital. Local business X doesn't have to pay for health care for another guy. They get socks to keep working doubles to pay rent and fire him when she gets sick. They love that shit. So, onto more subtle social systems. The gender binary is one of these that holds a special place in my heart. The crusty gunk on the inside of the walls specifically. It was spread heavily through Christian imperialism, but I need to learn more about that before I can include too many specifics in a video. So we'll be doing that one another time. I'm calling it subtle here because unlike apartments, it is an entirely a clear single jump, and it doesn't always involve stuff like the transfer of money. An important note here as well is that this stuff doesn't happen in a vacuum. Members of the state are obviously going to get kickbacks for making social systems more conducive for capitalism. Even without that, though, existing businesses in the area will do better by working for that as well. Walmart doesn't own apartments, but benefits from workers living in them. Whether the executives realize this or not, the businesses that reinforce these systems create the conditions required for them to spread more effectively. Fire does not wish to spread. Every bit of fire just builds the conditions for more fire. By heating everything up, this means, of course, that capitalists are not individual actors entirely fighting against each other. They also benefit from each other and can work together towards specific goals. Areas made of those that don't are simply weeded out. Like how individual capitalists in the same market are weeded out if they do not compete with each other. An ecosystem of domination. At the end of the day, I can just say, look at ghost towns. An Aries economy can literally get fucked up so bad it collapses, and people are forced to move, just like an ecology. Collusion of capitalists is a requirement for their survival. Now, I'm sure some of you are saying, ah yes, but what about laws? Can't the government fix this? The answer for now is a quick, lamau no. And we will get into the long Lamau No in a few minutes. I mean, it is literally based around paying wages. The state is just another capitalist beholden to these same trends. The gender binary is the foundation of organization in the society I live in. It is the basis of the modern family unit, the nuclear family. 
Two, air quote, opposites come together to share. They share in labor, they share in their house, they share in their food, they share in their free time, and they share in raising children. It is a unit of organization built on a form of group living with a maximum group size of two, and the temporary children that are supposed to move out after a bit. Industrialization applies to these groups too. You know what isn't efficient? Working in a group of two. How much more effort does it take to cook a pot of pasta for four people? The pot takes barely any more effort to stir. Same with the sauce. It takes nearly half the effort per serving to cook a quick meal for four people. That is a lot of time saved right there. That applies to the garden as well, and so many other facets of our lives. Yet housing, social, economic, and legal systems are built heavily around this. For housing, we often have a small group of people sharing space, but living independently or the two people making up the gender binary living together. This is heavily encouraged by how these are built. These housing conditions are made up of many little things, the size and layout of the kitchens to the amount of bedrooms, shared kitchen and apartment built for large-scale apartment-wide meals is not what we get. It is often a small kitchen built for many individuals to cook alone at different times. The size of the sink to the shape of the stove all contribute to this. You can clearly see the difference between a kitchen and an apartment versus a restaurant. For social, we have the way the dating scene is built up. How romance is portrayed in media. And things of that nature. How many shows feature relationships that are not monogamous? Out of those, how many do it in a good light? Then for the economic side... Loans for houses are often set up around a group of two partners. Insurance is set up the same way. Then we have many small things such as portion sizes for prepackaged food, the types of beds that are produced, and much more. Then we have the legal systems of marriage, limits to the conditions in which people can live together, and much more. Induced demand is also an important concept here. This is where the existence of a commodity drives demand for that commodity. It takes a lot of effort to design a new commodity, and people are going to want what they already see around them. At the end of the day, when I see a cinnamon roll on the shelf in front of me, I'm more likely to buy it than if I was left to think of what I want on my own. It takes a lot of effort to find things. What am I going to do? Spend three hours driving to different stores? One major example of induced demand is cars in the U.S. First, we expand a highway to add more lanes. Perfect. Now more people can get through, so there is less traffic. That means going to the highway is more worth it now, though. When it is more worth it, more people will go that route. More will take jobs that go that way. More will use it to go shopping, etc. This suddenly means it is filled up again. Another example is cars becoming more prevalent, which leads to the destruction of non-car transport, which leads to people demanding more cars, and them becoming more prevalent still. I grew up on a street with no sidewalk and by a road that was relatively dangerous to walk on, so that meant I had to rely on cars for transport more than I otherwise might have. With even less people using sidewalks down the street, because of that, they might eventually disappear too. Those gendered toys at McDonald's aren't some neutral fun. They are creating induced demand for the gender binary. My main point with all of this is all of capitalism works towards this goal. Every single place you look reinforces it. So here is the talk on government I promised. Imagine you are in a country trying to go green, buy a bunch of solar panels to save the planet. What are you going to do about China? All the capitalists are going to buy Chinese stuff because it is cheaper, and your manufacturers are going to leave for cheaper production. Imperialism, especially economic imperialism, is a big thing as well. Capitalists don't need to live in the country they own stuff in. We already talked about the local grocery store when Walmart comes knocking. That happens on a country-scale level every day. A global government wouldn't even help. That just turns it into a game of who can get away with the most without people rioting, just like it is today. If we want to be able to get rid of the gender binary, we need to get rid of capitalism, and vice versa.
I deleted a rant I had here, right at the end. It just ended up being me repeating myself a whole lot though. So instead, I will just summarize my points here. Capital makes more capital. On top of that, capital can directly undermine other capital, as it needs profit to exist. This means that capital must grow, and so selects for that which grows fastest, and spreads like a virus, turning more of society into itself. This leads to it reinforcing systems like the gender binary to support itself. There is no way to prevent it within the system. It is not all hopeless, though. There is something we can do. We can just get rid of capital as a form of organization itself. No wages and no profit. That will be the topic of the next video, though. In the future, I will cover topics such as anti-capitalism, both on this channel and on my stream. I got a whole lot to say on the subject. The link to my Twitch is in the description. Feel free to hang out there. Don't forget to leave a comment if you have anything to say or any questions. See y'all.